Well, good evening and welcome on behalf of the Presbytery of Ohio, the OPC Committee on Home Missions and Church Extension, Covenant Presbyterian Church, and the Montgomery's. We are so thankful and so glad to see all of you here, especially thankful for several who have traveled great distances to be with us today. We have a wonderful occasion this evening, um, seeing our dear brother, Jeremiah Montgomery, installed in his new capacity as General Secretary of Home Missions and Church Extension of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. And before we begin, just two quick announcements. One is, if you are a presbyter who rolled in late and haven't yet signed the sign-in sheet, if I could just ask Mr. Giesland to stand up. Um, if you could just see him after the service so he can rightly note your presence with us today, that'd be great. And then please also, after the worship service, all of you, we invite you to a reception as we celebrate together. And as we've gathered now to worship the one true living God, let's pause for a moment of silent prayer as we prepare our hearts for worship. People of God, look up as your God greets you. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who calls us to worship this evening in these words. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us, that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. And let's now raise our voices in praise to the living God with number 347 and the Red Trinity Hymnals, number 347, the Church's One Foundation. Please stand. Jesus is good. 
Let us pray. O Lord, our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it is with great joy and anticipation that we are gathered here together this evening. Lord, we are so thankful that in the Lord Jesus' ascension up into heaven, that in that great ascension, he did not leave his church lacking for anything. Lord, instead, he has given to us his spirit, the spirit of holiness, the spirit of Jesus himself, crucified and raised. And so we rejoice, Lord, that in having you, we, the church, truly have all that we need, including those wonderful gifts of the Spirit, shepherds and evangelists to lead the church in her labors as we seek to fulfill that great commission you gave us to make disciples of all nations, including in this great nation, the United States of America. And Lord, how our hearts yearn that this country, this place of our sojourning, would be filled with the knowledge of Jesus as the waters cover the sea. That, Lord, as you have promised, we would see this land transformed by a mighty outpouring of the Spirit of the living God, that as the Word of God is faithfully preached, and as new outposts of gospel preaching are established throughout our land, that, Lord, many would come under under the conviction of sin, and that a great awakening to the glorious sufficiency of Christ would envelop our country and that many new churches would be established where both the life-giving word and the life-sustaining sacrament would be rightly administered, and all that you, O Lord our God, that you would receive the glory and adoration that you rightly deserve. And so, Lord, we pray, use this service of installation as one step closer to answering this prayer for our land. And be honored now, we ask, in all that we now offer to you in worship, for we ask it, In the precious name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. You may be seated. I encourage you now to take your bulletins and perhaps also your reading glasses and look with me on the opposing side of the order of worship. You'll see there a summary of the gospel that's been crafted by Pastor Montgomery. And we'll use this together for our confession of faith as we offer in our, as an act of worship to God our confession of the faith that we hold dear and that we want to see go forward in this land. Saying now together, we believe in one true living and almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He made all things. He upholds all things. He owns all things. All things owe him praise. We believe God the Son entered history as a true and perfect man to rescue us from the holy path of God and the ruinous power of our own self-worship. His life is our righteousness. His death our forgiveness. His resurrection our confidence. Even the holes in our faith are paid for by the holes in his hands. We believe God the Spirit speaks in Scripture, changes our hearts, and gives us faith. By him, Christ lives in us. By him, we live in Christ. He enlivens our minds, retrains our affections, renews our wills, empowers our lives to love and live for Jesus. These things are supernatural. They are not irrational. We believe the church is the body of Christ. He is the head and we are the members, joined in one body by one spirit, to one Lord, through one faith, one baptism, and one supper, across place and time, language and tribe, Where he is, we are with him already. And wherever we are, he is with us always. We believe the gospel is God's open hand of love to the world. In it, Jesus Christ, with all his goodness, is offered freely and sincerely to every soul. Though our hands may not yet touch his person, yet our hearts may now take his promise. In receiving his promise, we receive him. 
for a promise can never be separated from its giver. We believe Christian faith consists in this, confessing Christ as my Lord and my God, committing my spirit and my destiny into his hands, believing that Jesus will keep his gospel promises to me. The moment we believe, we are changed forever, not by what we do, but by who we trust. We believe the Christian life has one great goal, to magnify and enjoy him forever, to taste and see that there is nothing better. The more we find satisfaction in him, the less we find satisfaction in sin. We live and work, we worship and witness, we do good deeds and embrace God's gifts, not because they make us look good, but because they are good and they make him smile. We believe that when sufferings come, we yet may rejoice, for they teach us to love God, not only for his gifts, but simply for himself. O cross proceed crown, our hearts are set free to love God, love neighbor, and expel all fear. Amen. Greetings, brothers and sisters. I'm uh, Paul Brown, uh, pastor of uh, the OP, one of the OPC congregations in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. I guess we're called Montoursville now. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I have known and uh, loved and admired Jeremiah, my brother, for a long time. So it is a great privilege and blessing and honor for me to come and um, to to preach the Word of God briefly um, here as he embarks on this next phase of his ministry. So thankful for Christ's call on his life and um, for his family and for the consecration of his gifts. So <clears throat> um, we will hear the Word of God and um, uh, I will seek to unfold it uh, briefly. I'm reading from Romans chapter 16, beginning at verse 1 and reading down through 16. 16, 1 through 16. This is God's word. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church at Sencreae, that you may welcome her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and help her in whatever she may need from you, for she has been a patron of many and of myself as well. Greet Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. Greet also the church in their house. Greet my beloved Epinetus, who was the first convert to Christ in Asia. Greet Mary, who has worked hard for you. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners. They are well known to the apostles, and they were in Christ before me. Greet Ampliatus, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and my beloved Stachus. Greet Apelles, who is approved in Christ. Greet those who belong to the family of Aristobulus. Greet my kinsman Herodian. Greet those in the Lord who belong to the family of Narcissus. Greet those workers in the Lord, Tryphena and Tryphosa. Greet the beloved Persis who has worked hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, also his mother who has been a mother to me as well. Greet Asyncretus, Phlegon, Hermes, Petrobus, Hermas, and the brothers who are with them. Greet Philologus, Julia, Nereus, and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. Well, as I conclude that reading of the Word of God, probably half of you are thinking he accidentally read the wrong text. 
And now we'll see if he'll just admit it and read the right text. Um, and I get that. This is like when you think of Romans, you don't say, oh, finally, this is the good part that I get to. This is the part we don't read or we skip over. This is, uh, I think it's a lot like the credits at the end of a movie. And you say, well, the movie might have been great, but, you know, the only guys who are still sitting there have either, either fallen asleep or are still trying to finish their bucket of popcorn. And um, <clears throat> I don't think we should look at this like, uh, like that. Um, uh, for me, it pulsates with the life and the vitality that should belong to a people who have grasped the main doctrines of the book of Romans, the doctrine of justification. How can a man or a woman, uh, sinners, be right before God? And the great book of Romans unfolds that and explains it and applies it. And, um, you know, through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the righteousness of God is given as a gift. You know, chapters three is that very crunchy statement. Uh, the righteousness of God, uh, for all who believe in Jesus Christ, um, because he was given by God as a, a propitiation in blood to be received by faith. So uh, even as we look at this text, you have to first say, you know, do I get that? Have I believed in Jesus? Are my sins forgiven? And has all of the righteousness of Jesus been credited to me, that double imputation that happens through the cross? But if you really get that, and you become a believer in Jesus, which happened to me when I was 24. It was the worst thing that ever could have happened to me, I thought. And yet it's the source of all good that I could ever have. Once you get that doctrine of justification, and Paul applies it and explains it, you come to this, which is this, this vital demonstration of love from the apostle for those who are justified. And so I don't think that we should read this as uh, looking, you know, looking, I don't think we should read it as, as the credits rolling at the end of the movie when you're kind of remembering the good parts. I think we should read this more as a kind of preview of coming attractions, a movie trailer of something that is only hinted at that you want to see in full. Because I do believe that uh, the Apostle Paul here in Romans 16, as he's inspired by the Spirit to write these, the living, breathing words of God, as the Holy Spirit works in him, the mind of Christ, as he can say like in Philippians 1.8, I yearn for you with the bowels of Christ, the deep heart love of Christ. That's, you know, what we love each other with. It's the love of Christ working through us. And he can, the Apostle Paul could say that about the believers that he served, and all believers. And what I actually see now here that makes this passage not an afterthought that you skip over in your daily devotionals and go find something that will feed your soul. Instead, we should read this as a sample ahead of time of the love and approval and commendation of the Lord Jesus Christ on the Day of Judgment for those who have come to understand and believe and experience the gospel doctrine of justification where our sins are forgiven and the whole inheritance of Jesus Christ is granted to us and received by faith, where there is absolutely, as Paul says in Romans 8, 1, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We have become as he says, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, so that all that Jesus deserves for his faithfulness, for his condescension and love to obey the Father, all that he deserves is now credited to us. And you can see that the Apostle Paul enters into this, uh, I think you can, you can trace, uh, you can feel uh, the love bursting forth from his heart, <laughs> from the pen, uh, because he doesn't want to write a letter. He would rather be speaking face to face. But there is this palpable love that he feels for these brothers and sisters, and he wishes he could be with them. I do believe that this is the very judgment day, judgment day, love and approval of Jesus Christ 
for all of his beloved brothers and sisters, spoken ahead of time by the Apostle Paul, to give us hope, as this is why I'm preaching on this passage today, um, when we, we, we see our brother uh, take up the work of helping the OPC uh, plant churches and further the church extension of our denomination and help train church planters and, and really help all of us pastors do a better job, that this love and this approval that Jesus feels, this deep, deep outward flow of affection from the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ reigning in heaven toward his approved people, that this needs to inform and shape all of our churches, whether they're old or new, all of our church planters and all of our pastors, whether they're old or new. I believe this, that the Apostle Paul is is the living image of the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, that's the promise, that as we come to Jesus Christ, we're renewed in the image of our Creator and true knowledge and righteousness, and we begin to look like Him and speak like Him. And uh, I find that tremendously exciting. So the Apostle Paul, well, first of all, we stuffy OPC types. How many of you have ever been transferred by a letter of standing or a letter of transfer? And you say, where is that in the Bible? Well, it's right there, actually. Um, I was very gratified when I first realized that. Um, so Phoebe is coming by letter of transfer from Sancria to Rome. And the book of Romans is the deepest theological exposition of the gospel and the doctrine of justification. It's also a missionary support letter in Romans 15. I love that. And it's also a letter of transfer for one Phoebe moving from first OPC in Sancria to first OPC of Rome. And uh, so that's why Paul is commending his, our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church at St. Crea. So <clears throat> it's, it's a letter of transfer, but it's also a list of names. There's 24 people named. There's two unnamed. There's 10 women. The names are uh, apparently uh, all variously Hebrew, Greek, and Latin, a very diverse group who have been brought together through faith, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ whom the Apostle Paul is loving and commending and approving all ahead of time. For our purposes today of church planting and our, our understanding that there's just really one church over which Jesus is King and Lord, there are churches listed here. There's the church at Sincrea, there's all the churches of the Gentiles, there's the various churches in their houses, there are house churches spread around Rome, yet it's one church. And this confirms our deep Presbyterian views that, that there's many churches where the saints are temporarily shepherded and prepared for glory, but there's one church, and there's a regional church um, where you kind of come together, but there's one church. And it's a beautiful thing that in the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, we recognize that, and we try to extend love to all of our brothers and sisters whatever their various diverse denominational views and practices are, as far as we can go. That's a beautiful thing. Another beautiful thing here is that um, there are families listed, um, multiple families, married couples, mothers, sons, kinsmen, and yet there's another family that is coming into reality more and more deeply so that Paul can say, well, well, his mother was just like my mother. And he can call these people brothers and sisters. And four times he just says they're beloved. And this is a wonderful thing, too. And this is what our church is, this is, this is the, the direction, then, of our individual and corporate sanctification, that we know that we're no longer just individual families or even individual churches, but we are the family and household of God, no longer strangers and sojourners. And we have to be led by our sessions and taught by our pastors. We have to have it modeled that uh, we should love each other deeply and fervently from the heart. And this, we don't have to be communistic. We don't need to be weird and cultish. We're still married to one another individually. We still have individual families and and residences, but we're moving to that time when the single union that will define all of us is no longer being married 
to, to husbands and wives. It's, it's our union with Jesus Christ in the perfect intimacy and overwhelming power of glory. It will be our wedding with the Lamb that is the deepest intimacy that will finally satisfy every human longing. And it is up to the elders and pastors to shape their churches to long for that so that those who are married, as Paul put it confusingly in 1 Corinthians 7, should live as if they're not married. Wait a minute. <laughs> but the idea is that we're becoming one family, brothers and sisters who love each other deeply, who are moving into that as Paul expresses it here with such excitement. And what these... Um, you know, so I believe that's, that's informative for us, that the deepest theological book of the Bible should also have the longest set of, of personal greetings and, and outpouring of love at the end of it. If we really are thinking we've got the doctrine of justification and we're reformed, without this kind of love, it's only sounding brass. It accomplishes nothing. It is what counts is our faith working through love. And what the Bible tells us is that it's our brothers and sisters with whom we will share eternity in the presence of Jesus who are those that we should first love and then outsiders because our union with our brothers and sisters in Christ is stronger than our blood union even with others in our families. And what Paul shows us here as he shows us Christ, and he shows us judgment day love, so that we can lift up our heads, so that we can have hope, and we can really pray, Lord Jesus, come, come quickly, not, Lord Jesus, take your time, I messed up today. <laughs> There's no more condemnation. Jesus loves us deeply. He's been, he's deeply anticipating that day when, you know, like in First, uh, Second Thessalonians says that he will come to be glorified in his saints and marveled at by all who have believed. It will be the day of his consummating joy when he says to us, enter into the joy of your master. And it will be the great day of his joy when all of his blood-bought children are gathered around him as well for the first time. It will be the day when the universe of men and angels finally sees the consummate glory of Jesus as never before possible until all of us for whom he shed his blood are gathered around to reflect his glory all about this universe forever and ever. And so if we think about that, you know, we should ask ourselves, do I really want to be with Jesus? Do I lift up my head knowing that the day of my redemption draws near, as Jesus said? We should. You know, he said that, you know, like um, Hebrews 9, 27, which I've got printed here somewhere, but I'd rather just slaughter it. This is a paraphrase, you know. It says, um, you know, it says that he's going to come back as it was. He has appeared once uh, at the end of the ages to put away sin, to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, and it says he's going to appear once at the end of the ages, not to deal with sin, not to deal with sin, he's done that, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Are you eagerly waiting for Jesus? Because you know this doctrine of justification, that through faith alone, your sins are pardoned, and the whole righteousness of Jesus has been granted to you entire and free. And then you can say, yes, come, Lord Jesus. He's not going to come and pick and nag and frown at us. He's going to come to pour out all that undeserved love and grace and give us his glory. He's not going to come to find fault with us over our sins. He's going to come, as it says, to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. And so what we ministers should do, what we elders should do, and the kind of churches that we want to plant and be is to do two things following Paul's example here. And that is to lead the way in communicating that God accepts his people in all of their terrible and real sin. That's what a letter of standing does. It says Phoebe is a Christian. She's a sister. Receive her.
as such. And Paul commends her for her faithful work. And so when we send these letters of transfer or standing, we're saying, this is a brother, this is a sister, they've done good work, they've been faithful, receive them. That is kind of a categorical thing that ministers should do for all their people. We need to build each other, we need to build up our people. We need to press upon them and, 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 and as it were, sometimes force into their thinking that they're Christians. Yes, you just blew it. Yes, you just sinned again. Yes, we're going to help you. Yes, you need discipling. But you're a Christian. You are a believer in Jesus. Don't you remember the struggle of faith and the hope that you've had? And so now this is the time to keep going, sister. You're a believer. You're accepted and loved. And soon the struggle will be over. You serve the Lord Christ. There is a reward. Your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And this is what the Apostle Paul does here. He commends all of these. He calls them brothers and sisters, and he wants them greeted, strengthened, and encouraged. This is what ministers, ministers and elders should do for their flocks, because this is what Jesus will do. He cannot wait to see us, to be with us, to commend us, to praise us, and he will do so in ways that we don't possibly expect. You know, in the great story he told in Matthew 25 about when the king comes at the end of the age with all of his angels around him, and he gathers the nations before him as, as a shepherd gathers the, you know, the, the goats on the right, or the goats on the left, and the sheep on the right. And, um, and he says to his sheep, you know, blessed are you, come inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Because when I was hungry, when I was naked, when I was sick, and when I was in prison, you came and did all these things for me. And you, you know, you've read that, Matthew 25, the response of, of the brothers and sisters will be, huh? When did, I, when did I do that, Lord? And the whole point is that he's watching over us for good, and everything that we've ever done that didn't register in us because we're in the thick of the battle and we're so overwhelmed with the struggle and with our remaining sins, he knows, and he's recording, and he will pour out his approval and commendation. He's not going to pick, nag, criticize, carp. He's going to finally pour out comfort. He's going to say, comfort, comfort, ye my people. So ministers and elders should lead the way in communicating love and praise and commendation. She has been a patron of many and of myself as well. Others who risk their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. Greet Apelles, who is approved in Christ, for your obedience is known to all, so that I rejoice over you. You see all these samples. You should read them. You should take these devotionally. This is from the heart of the apostle, who is filled with the Spirit of Christ. And I think, truly and appropriately, you can apply many of these things to yourself who is approved in Christ. That applies to absolutely every Christian. And this is a sample of his favor on the last day. And the other thing is not only should we lead the way in, in helping our brothers and sisters to know their true status and commend them as Christians in Christ, it's to commend their works as acceptable in Christ. It's not only we, it's not only that our persons are accepted as believers justified, it's our works. We offer up acceptably in Christ spiritual sacrifices. That's biblical. And so the Apostle Paul does that. He says, Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers, Mary, who has worked hard, Urbanus, our fellow worker in the Lord, those workers in the Lord, Tryphena and Tryphosa, Persis, who has worked hard in the Lord, the Lord you should know as you offer your very self and devote yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ every day, sometimes feeling like such a failure sometimes dealing with the bitterness of a sin that you've fallen into yet again. He sees, he knows, he hears your groaning, he keeps track of your wanderings and he stores up your tears in his bottle. And so you take this to heart and you're strengthened for the day. And this helps you in the Christian race and the struggle to know that at the end of it is not a frowning savior who regrets that he poured out his blood for losers like us but a good shepherd who rejoices once and forever that his sheep are safe forever with him as he prayed, Father, I pray 
that they may be with me to see my glory. And Jesus will be full of infinite and overflowing joy that will be ours forever without any more tears or regrets. And so we as pastors are not doing our work if we do not produce in you, brothers and sisters, a love and trust of the Lord Jesus Christ as that ultimately gentle pastor of the church who longs to be with his people, who accepts you, who loves you without any second thoughts, so that you truly can pray, Lord Jesus, come, come quickly. And if our churches like this, our churches are like this, and the churches that we plant are like this, it will be a compelling witness to a world that's becoming increasingly embittered and distrustful of any genuine lasting love. We have to show them the only love that can satisfy the human heart. It is the love of Jesus Christ. It is yours entirely by faith. The moment you believe in Jesus, you know, even in this beautiful summary of the gospel that we just read, we are changed forever, and Jesus is ours. There is no more condemnation. And we ministers need to repent deeply of that sometimes, <laughs> that scowl, that shake of the head <laughs> that we have when we have to rescue some other sheep who has fallen into a sin and, and we're exhausted and we start complaining. That is not the mind and heart of the Good Shepherd who reigns over us in heaven. God, give us grace to look to his Son, that we should become like him, and that our churches should show the glory of his heavenly love and his heavenly grace all ahead of time. And you, brother, I think you do this well. And um, I'm eager and excited to see how you will help to lead the OPC further into this. And thankful for those workers <laughs> who have gone before you as well. So let's, um, I don't know, should I pray? I think we should just sing, actually, is what I think. So <laughs> in response to the word of God, let's stand and sing uh, hymn, one, hymn 81, O Love of God, How Strong and True.
may be seated. Come now to a very special moment in the life of our brother Jeremiah, the point at which he will be installed as the General Secretary of Home Missions and Church Extension. So if you could please have Reverend Montgomery come forward. Just a few words of background. Our brother was called by the General Assembly of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church through its Committee on Home Missions and Church Extension to take up the Office of Evangelist, serving as the Committee's General Secretary. His call is to lead the Committee as it seeks to advance the church planting and evangelistic mission of our denomination. And this role will require many miles of travel, an abundance of energy and of love. And he will need to give faithful counsel and encouragement for church planters to be faithful in stewarding the church's resources. And in all, he will need much wisdom and therefore the prayers of you, God's people. Having received this call, the Presbytery of Ohio has concurred with this call. And so we come now to the point where we will ask our brother to accept this call formally by affirming the following two vows. And so as the moderator appointed for this meeting of the Presbytery, on, the behalf, of the, on behalf of the Presbytery, I now ask you, Jeremiah Montgomery, to make the following vows before God and before these witnesses. Do you conscientiously believe and declare, as far as you know your own heart, that in taking upon you the work of an evangelist, you are influenced by a sincere desire to promote the glory of God and the good of his church? I do. Are you now willing to undertake the work of General Secretary for the Committee of Home Missions and Church Extension of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church? And do you promise to be faithful in the discharge of all the duties of this ministry, as God may give you strength? I therefore now declare that Jeremiah Montgomery has been regularly installed as an evangelist for the purpose of serving as the General Secretary for the Committee of Home Missions and Church Extension of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church agreeably to the Word of God and according to the Constitution of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, and that he is entitled to all that honor, encouragement, and obedience in the Lord to which his office entitles him. We thank you, brother. You're going to take your seat. We'll ask Reverend Shishko to now come forward to give the charge. I have one verse to read from the book of Philippians. Chapter 1, verse 6. Where the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for this evening and another opportunity to consider what you have done throughout history and what you have brought us to and where we stand and worship even this evening. We pray that you would send that same Holy Spirit that inspired Paul to write these words so long ago that you would send him to us here tonight that we might be transformed by the truth of your very word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Not quite four years ago, after the Montgomery family relocated from China to Dayton, and the Shishko family from the New York City area to Columbus, both from foreign lands of one kind or another. 
I was tremendously encouraged and comforted by Reverend Jeremiah Montgomery delivering a charge to me at the installation service at Grace Orthodox Presbyterian Church in Columbus. And I'm very thankful to return the favor tonight. Uh, back then, almost four years ago, the Jeremiah, Pastor Jeremiah Montgomery, directed my attention to the Apostle Paul and called my attention to various verses that were tremendously helpful and helped me to identify with the Apostle Paul in helpful ways. And uh, as I return the favor, I'll do the same going back to the Apostle Paul, but also reminding all of you there's a biblical reason to do this, just this. We do certainly have Jesus Christ as an example to look to all the time, but there is some tremendous comfort in looking at Paul because he was there at the beginning of the New Testament church and he was a sinner like us, a man of like passion who needed to repent at various points in his life and ask for forgiveness, which is where we find ourselves so frequently. And so it's, it's amazing that Paul says, even though he's a sinner like us, he will say, imitate me insofar as I am like Jesus Christ. And then in the book of Philippians that we've already read from, he says, brethren, join in following my example. And in chapter 4, verse 9, these things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. So it's certainly appropriate for us as pastors, ministers, general secretaries, to identify with the Apostle Paul and look to him as an example that we should emulate and consider in our own ministries. And it's not hard when it comes to where, Jeremiah, you're at this evening as we think about the Apostle Paul and the installation that just occurred, that phrase, many miles of travel. Almost within that phrase alone, we are begin thinking about the Apostle Paul. Church after church after church, letter after letter, after letter, meeting after meeting after meeting, sermon after sermon after sermon. But especially as we think of that travel, I want to um, call your attention to something a friend of mine at Grace Orthodox Presbyterian Church in Columbus spoke to me about, and it was just su such an encouragement and an interesting, tremendous, helpful observation. We're familiar with Paul's biography, his autobiography, which he gives in various verses, and we, we read about him being shipwrecked and beaten with rods and stoned and left for dead and imprisoned and mistreated and scorned and persecuted, all of these sorts of things as he goes from church to church to church. And we quickly look at that and say, the gospel must be true. It must be glorious and real. It certainly was to Paul. What else could have brought him to go from church to church to church like that under such opposition and persecution? And this friend of mine back in Columbus said, it's not only that. It's that in those letters that he's writing, Romans and Philippians, for instance, he's daydreaming about doing more of these visits that bring him such pain and anguish. So in Romans 1, 9 through 15, these are just selections from that section, knowing all the opposition in his life, he says, I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will, I may at last succeed in coming to you, for I long to see you. I have often intended to come to you, but I have been prevented. I am eager to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. Opposition, persecution, beating, shipwreck, imprisonment, scorn, opposition. I can't wait to see you. Even with all that opposition, I, I long to see you. I, I'll, I'll do what it takes to be in your presence. And I hope even just that is um, something of an encouragement for you as you go into a calling with many miles of travel before you. But I do want to bring Philippians 1, 6 to bear on your thinking. I think we've both been in ministry long enough to know that sometimes what we do 
is accompanied with really fantastic adjectives. It was a great meeting. It was a terrific time at that church. It was a wonderful time of fellowship. It was at least constructive. It was fantastic. Everything went so well. Fantastic times, meetings, worship opportunities, traveling, all of those sorts of things. But we've been in ministry long enough to know that those adjectives sometimes give way to the weary, worn, weathered, and bland adjective, another. Another meeting. Another airplane ride. Another trip to the airport. Another letter to the committee. Another committee meeting. Another, another, another. Weary, worn, bland. And what I want to do, just realizing that we cope with this in ministry, as every minister does, is hopefully give you a, an illustration that will help you out, that will come when your labor as the General Secretary of Home Missions for the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, as that begins to pick up that bland flavor of just more and more, another, another, another. I'd ask you to think about a window. A window that you are looking out of from the inside. And just imagine this particular window has a tremendous view that will help us in a few moments. But what I want to call your attention to is a quirk about being in that situation, standing in front of a window with a tremendous view. That window, in some way, will reflect you standing in that window and your immediate circumstances, the room within that win window is placed. And here's the quirk. If you look at that reflection in the window and how it reflects you and your immediate circumstances, you will not see the tremendous view on the other side of that window. You, and this is something that is true for anybody, in that situation, if you look at the reflection in the window, you cannot see what's beyond it. You'll see yourself and your immediate circumstances, but not the environment that is beyond that window. And I believe the Apostle Paul found his source of strength, his motivation, his joy, his delight, even from prison cells, by looking through the window, not becoming transfixed or obsessed with his reflection or the reflection of his immediate circumstances, but with Christ himself, to some extent, being the window, looking through the window to the tremendous view. And I think he communicates to us how he's doing this by saying in Philippians 1.6, I am confident of this very thing. I, I am sure of this. We quickly jump to the promise part of Philippians 1.6, and I think it certainly is a promise, and we'll talk about it in a moment. But don't you love that the Apostle Paul worked to get himself to a place of confidence about what was coming? He looked through the window and said, I'm sure of this. The Lord is going to bring to completion this good work that he has begun in his people. And I want to just tack on various items that you can, should see through the window instead of obsessing over your reflection and the reflection of your immediate circumstances. Look, look through that window knowing that the Lord has begun a good work and that he will bring it to completion. And then think of other verses, many of which you've memorized and know or are just familiar with from reading through Scripture, how Paul saw the church that he was working for, working to establish. Focus on that, that word you in Philippians 1.6. Let's just think about that word you for the rest of this time during this charge. You, you all, 
If you permit a Yankee to borrow a great word from the South, y'all, you, you all, y'all, is all in that word you in Philippians 1.6. And that you is the tremendous view Paul sees even from his prison cell. And how does he refer to the people of that you, you all, y'all? Over and over in the epistles, brothers and sisters, beloved, saints. He doesn't look through the window and see another sinner and another situation or another sinner and another situation. He sees brethren, the beloved, saints. In 2 Corinthians 3, 18, he says, We all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed from one degree of glory to another. Brethren, beloved, saints, transformed and being transformed ongoingly. Ephesians 2.10 says we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. And that word workmanship, you know, is the Greek word poem, from which we get poem. He's writing, making, living poems. Brethren, beloved, saints, transformed, being transformed ongoingly, living poems of God's grace. 2 Corinthians 3, verses 2 through 3, Paul writes, You are our letter. You are a letter of Christ, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. Living poems, living epistles. Of course, Romans 8, 29 through 30. Those he foreknew, he predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these he predestined, he called, and those he called, he justified, and these he justified, he glorified. Brethren, beloved, saints, transformed, being transformed ongoingly, living poems, living epistles, Brethren of Jesus Christ, predestined for glorification, foreknown, called, justified eventually to be glorified. 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 through 20. For who is our hope or joy or crown of exaltation? Is it not even you, you all, y'all, you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming for you are our glory and joy. Instead of focusing on his own dingy circumstances and his own reflection in the window, he looks through the window to the tremendous view of what the Lord Jesus Christ is doing, and he sees brethren, beloved saints, who are transformed and being transformed ongoingly, who are living poems, who are written by God himself, not with ink, but on their very hearts as living epistles, who are brethren of Jesus Christ, predestined for glorification, Already foreknown, justified, called, eventually to be glorified. He sees it so clearly, he calls those that consist of that you that he's looking at through the window. His hope, his joy, his crown of exaltation, his glory and joy. Not just another sinner or another situation. Instead, he sees these members of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want us to just take one step further while we consider 
the same word, you, you all, y'all, from Philippians 1, 6. And this might be a little meta, but it's orthodox and theological, so it's worth our while. Paul, of course, was writing to the Philippians, and it's so exciting to realize that when Paul said you to the Philippian church, he had the Philippians immediately in mind, but we know from our understanding of Scripture itself, it's meant not just for the Philippians, but for the church of all ages, and has nourished countless congregations ever since Paul penned it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to the Philippians. But when we read you in Philippians 1.6, and we think of everything we've talked about so far, that the church is made up of brethren, beloved saints, living poems, living epistles, those who are predestined to glorification, image bearers of Jesus Christ, over and over and over again, every single day. Realize that that church includes the church under your own roof. And that one of our great blessings as ministers of the gospel is not just to see saints transformed from one degree of glory to another, but that we get to see our own families transformed from one degree of glory to another throughout the course of our ministry, not only to others, but also to them. This is so meaningful to me, Jeremiah, because I've had the privilege of not only seeing my own children grow up to becoming teenagers or close to teenagers, but I've I've had the privilege of seeing Gavin and Logan and Ewan and Aiden and Rhiannon grow up. I knew them as little children when we were in seminary together. I had that privilege of starting to get to know your family. So I'm simply calling you to continue seeing your wonderful bride, Beth, and your wonderful five children as part of this tremendous picture, this tremendous view. Look through that window and see your own children and your own wife as part of those who are being transformed from one degree of glory to another, being made into the image of Christ, predestined for glorification as living poems written by God himself. And if you'll go even further with me. Through that window is also you, Jeremiah W. Montgomery. Think about that passage I read before, 2 Corinthians 3.18. Paul doesn't say, you all are being transferred formed from one degree of glory to another, but we all, we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. As you refuse to transfix and obsess over that reflection in the mirror and look through it at the tremendous view before you, you see yourself in that. You realize that through your very ministry, as you tend to the saints of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, as you love and serve your wife, as you minister to your own children, the Lord is transforming you from one degree of glory to another as a living epistle, as a living poem, predestined for glorification. And to all of those things that I've repeated over and over, we add what is written in Philippians 1.6. There's no reason for discouragement. Paul was sure of it. 
He came back to it over and over and over again. This confidence enabled him to not only endure the opposition, but even in the face of opposition, long to go visit other churches, long to go miles and miles and miles for the next meeting or the next sermon or the next conference or the next evangelistic opportunity. Because he was confident of this. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. If you might permit me just just one more step. I do love that the Apostle Paul said, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. And through your charge in preparing this charge, I've been so encouraged by the life of the Apostle Paul and what we have of it. And I remember doing the charge for James Stafford and focusing on the Apostle Paul as well. But go beyond the Apostle Paul to Jesus Christ. Fix your eyes on Jesus, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. What a thought that is. Whatever's on your horizon, no matter how difficult it is, no matter how boring it might be, no matter how stressful, no matter how taxing, it's not the cross that Jesus Christ bore, but it might be your cross that you bear out of love and allegiance to him. And as he hung there on the cross for the joy set before him, he saw that tremendous view. He saw living epistles. He saw brethren, the beloved, saints made holy by his perfect sacrifice, who were predestined for glorification, who had would one day begin the process of becoming holy that he himself, through the work of the Holy Spirit, would bring to completion. Look through that window. Ignore the reflection. Fix your eyes on Jesus, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. Father in heaven, we thank you for how you equip us through your word, how humbling it is to, on this very day, think of ourselves as ministers in the church of the New Testament. And to have you to look to directly, as well as the comfort of knowing all that we do about the Apostle Paul. Strengthen us, send us your spirit, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Greetings, brothers and sisters. Uh, My name is Bullet Yasaram. Coming from St. Augustine, Florida, I'm the minister of another OPC church with a rare and very creative name, Covenant Presbyterian Church. But I'm delighted to be here because Jeremiah has been a very good friend to me and I'm equally excited for the ministry ahead of my brother, uh, which I know he will carry out wonderfully. But uh, the best thing and the wisest thing that we can do for this brother is to bring him before Jesus personally and now here together so let's go before the lord and seek his wisdom and bring our brother before him our blessed and heavenly father we thank you for your heavenly gift your son jesus christ who appeared from heaven to establish to redeem and to shepherd your church. We give you praise, O Lord, that we have come to know and experience your love and your care through your Son, our Redeemer, who became unto us salvation, redemption, and even life itself. In fact, we find comfort and assurance, O Lord, that Jesus is the head of your church, and he shall never fail your people. 
And yes, in him, we will always find life and that abundantly. We're thankful, O Lord, that none of us can love your church more deeply and care for her more intimately than Jesus. Yet we're also grateful that you are pleased to use agents, servants that sacrificially serve to advance your kingdom. We give you thanks for such a servant, our brother Jeremiah. We give you thanks for all the gifts with which you equipped him. We give you thanks for all the experiences that he had in your providence. We thank you, O Lord, that you guided his steps and providentially gave him all things so that he could serve as a church planter in State College, so he would bless your people through his work in Asia as a missionary, so that he could shepherd your people even here at Covenant through his ministry and pastoral work. Yet we also recognize our Father in heaven that all the steps our brother has taken, all the experiences that he has had, trained his heart and brought him all the way to this moment so that he would take his high calling and continue to serve on the denominational level to lead the home missions in the OPC. We pray now then that the OPC will be blessed by our brother's endeavors and through his leadership we would see more Bible studies, more church plants, and more established churches that would exist for the glory of Jesus and the salvation of many. Use him mightily among us, O Lord, for the sake of Jesus and his people. And as he serves, bring about in his heart that deep satisfaction in Jesus and more love for our people. But we also pray, O God, that you would protect his heart and guide his steps so that as he serves, that his love for Jesus would grow and grow, his affections would widen up, and his heart would be enlarged to receive all people for the glory of Christ. We also remember his family. Please bless Beth and all the children that they would be the immediate beneficiaries of our brother's ministry. Prepare their hearts, O God, that they would become good partners in the gospel and reward them for their sacrifices so that they would see that the gospel ministry is not in vain. We also give you thanks, O Lord, for Covenant OPC here in Vandalia. We praise you for the fruit of their faith and their willingness to send out one of their own for the good of your bride. Your hand of mercy would be upon them in this time of transition and help them to continue to thrive as a church. So our brother Jeremiah's joy would be complete and their hearts would be delighted in the special care and the providence of our Lord Jesus. We also intercede for our brother John Shaw and thank you for his many years of ministry. Thank you for our, our brother's faithfulness and, and pastoral work. We praise you, O Lord, for all the, the, all the times that you mightily used him in your kingdom, have done wonderful things. Now we pray, O God, that as our brother transitions back into local church, encourage his heart, train his soul, and continue to use him to give Christ to a perishing world. Fill his heart, O God, with that delight and satisfaction in his ministry. Above all, O oh Father, we are more thankful than anything else for your hand and faithfulness, how you have loved your flock and lead her in the path of righteousness. Today be with us and remind us of our name in the book of life, that we, that we shall never be blotted out, for Jesus himself is our Lord. For he perished for our sake on the cross. His name has been forgotten. That he was cursed, he took the bad word, he got the malediction so we can get the benediction. Thank you, O God, for this gospel. Remind us the beauty of Jesus and the wonder of the gospel so freshly today that we would commit ourselves to Jesus, support our brother in his endeavors, and cry out to him, cry out to you for his success and your church's growth. Now hear all these things, O oh God, and the ones that we could not even remember in the name of Jesus and for his glory. Amen. We're going to continue to worship by singing, I will glory in my Redeemer. So let us stand together and you will find the hymnal in your pews. It is psalm hymns and spiritual songs, that, the one with the black cover. It's going to be the, the hymn 11. 11, let us sing unto our God.
forever to behold. Beloved, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.